Hello, everyone, and welcome to this IANA webinar, part of the Intermodal Connect series of webinars uh, brought to you by the Intermodal Association of North America. It is great to have you all here today uh, for this session of Inside the Numbers with our friends over at TTX. Um, it's great to have them here with us. And uh, with that, I would like to uh, introduce today's guests our crew from TTX, a couple of familiar faces, as well as a new face. Um, so first and foremost, let me welcome our, our, our new guest, Trevor Gillen, who is the Director of Economic Planning over at TTX. Uh, we are also joined by our old friend, Peter Wolf, who is the uh, Director of Market Development at TTX, as well as John Woodcock who is also a director of market development. We're excited to have Trevor uh, join the team and, and bring some new experience and, and thoughts to the process. So with that, I am going to turn it over to our crew from TTX and I will join you on the other side for some Q&A and discussion. Take it away, Trevor. Cool, thanks, Hal. So today we just wanna kind of go over a couple of things to set the stage with the economy discuss a couple of current economic conditions, and just a few things to keep an eye on moving forward. We're also going to take a look at some key economic indicators, such as consumer spending, inflation, inventories, things like that, that, that relate to freight. And then I'll hand it off to the rest of the team. And uh, I believe we'll have some question, some time for some questions towards the end. So to start things off, we'll, we're going to take a look at uh, how GDP is performing these days. And so what this slide shows is raw real GDP is the yellow line. So that's inflation adjusted GDP in its raw form. And then the red bars are showing the annualized growth rate in the, uh, the red bars. And so what we wanna take a look at here is obviously the most recent two red bars, we see a minus 1.6% decline in the first quarter and a minus, it's kind of hard to see, but a minus 0.6% decline in the second quarter. And so I know that kind of throws a lot of red flags out there for people, you know, to kind of say two co consecutive quarters is a recession, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. But what I want to focus on is that yellow line towards the top. And so what, what is really important distinction between this year and last year, and, you know, comparing the year end growth rates from here to, from here to then is take a look at that yellow line and the first two quarters of this year you can see that those two dots are significantly higher than where we were at in the first quarter of 21, second quarter, third quarter, and so on and so forth. But it just was that huge increase that we saw in the fourth quarter that kind of set the tone for 2022. And so it, it was a really steep increase to end the year in 2021. And now we're just kind of leveling off from that perspective. But again, significantly higher than where we were at in the first three quarters. And that's what we want to focus on. And if you look at that little gray box, it might be difficult to see, but basically at an annualized rate where we're at in the in 2022 is right around this $19.7 trillion mark. And that is uh, about 1.5% higher than all of 2021. Again, we're talking about annualized rates here. So what that means is what if GDP were to stop today, this is what it would be at for the remainder of the year if it were to continue to grow at the rate that it's growing. And so right now, we're already looking at a 1.5% year-over-year growth rate. And so we'll get more into it on the next slide, but some of the, the culprits for these declines in the first two quarters are kind of what, what, I've been, what I've been telling the people at TTX are mean reverting volatile components of GDP. Things like inventories, things like government spending, things like net exports. These are all components that we'll talk a little bit more on the next slide, but these are all components that were kind of thrown out of whack during COVID and, and kind of, you know, put on a, a bizarre path due to COVID. And now they're kind of reverting back to the mean or reverting back to their average growth rates. And with that comes a decline in GDP. And so, like I said, before we move on to the next slide, while some people, some news outlets and, and the general definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of decline. And the one thing I want to point out is that the National Bureau of Economic Research cites the definition for a full-blown recession as being something that's affecting across multiple sectors in the economy, you know, not just GDP. We're talking about production. We're talking about consumer spending. We're talking about employment. And, you know, 
if you if you uh, pay attention to some of the economic news like I do, I not I know not everybody does, but again, those things are kind of all at record highs. Like we're at around full employment, we're at elevated consumer spending, and we're at you know record high industrial production. So as long as those are kind of firing on all cylinders, it, it's kind of hard to justify the recession talk just yet. And I'm not saying I'm not ruling anything out moving forward, but we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next coming slides. So yeah, just want to spend a quick couple of minutes here on what happened in the second quarter and in the first quarter and what's really driving these declines. And like I said, you know, we're looking at these mean reverting volatile components of GDP, like inventories and government spending. And you can see that on this slide, the grayed out regions, the personal consumption expenditures, the gross private domestic investment, net exports, government spending, if you add up all of those yellow bars, you're going to get that minus 0.6% total if you view these as percentage points that we saw in the second quarter. Same thing goes for the red lines. That reflects in the, the, the grayed out bars reflect the 1.6% decline we saw in the first quarter. And so, like I said, these more volatile components were thrown out of whack, like net exports and things like the change in private inventories you can kind of see in the middle there shaved about 1.8 percentage points off of GDP in the second quarter. And, you know, that's a pretty significant chunk. And consumer spending on goods took nearly half a percentage point off of GDP in the second quarter. So just kind of things that were elevated or at, you know, significantly higher rates throughout COVID are now kind of coming back down to normal levels, like government spending, for example. There was a lot of government uh, stimulus that was being uh, issued throughout the pandemic. Now that that's coming back down, we're going to see continued decreases in government spending, and that's going to pull GDP down. Same with private inventories, different things like that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in detail in the next couple of slides. This is just something to kind of showcase where we're at currently and why it's not necessarily reflective of the typical recessions that we've seen in the past. So what this chart shows is real GDP versus nominal GDP. And what that means is real GDP, the red line, is adjusted for inflation. And nominal GDP is just the raw GDP number the, that's not being adjusted for inflation at all. The reason why the two intersect at around 2012 is when is because that's when the, uh, the inflation rate is uh, chained to $2,012. So that's why they invert behind there. But ultimately, what I want to focus on is that during the typical recessions, which are the shaded out regions, the 2008 and the, the COVID 2020 recession, you know, you see both inflation adjusted and nominal GDP declining. And that just tells you that no matter what's happening with inflation, no matter what's happening with the economy, both of these are declining. And that is what a typical recession shows. What we're seeing now is that is a, is a very different scenario and something that's relatively unusual. But the nominal GDP, the yellow line, continues to grow. And so this has kind of been like the new phenomenon that people are talking about recently uh, in the economics world is that while, you know, the economy is growing, it's still growing uh, quarter over quarter, but it's just not growing as fast as inflation. So when you see that headline number that gets, you know, posted in the news and things like that, the real GDP, the red line, where it sees it kind of leveling off, that's inflation adjusted. And so that just tells you that while the, while the economy is growing, it's just not growing as fast as inflation. Kind of a bizarre concept to, to digest, but it's a bizarre time that we're living in in terms of economics. So just something to keep in mind that the economy fundamentally remains relatively strong. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that on the next couple of slides. So in this chart, we're going to talk about consumer spending. And what we're seeing here is Inflation adjusted consumer expenditures on the grade region, which is services, the yellow line, which is durable goods, and the red line, which is non durable goods. And again, this is all inflation adjusted. So, what we're noticing, and this is kind of like an industry wide trend that we're noticing, is that consumers are shifting away from spending on goods towards services. You know, this is you know, what you guys have probably all heard before is that this is less people staying at home due to COVID and shopping online and having these delivered to the house. This is more a reflection, the, the most recent trend we're seeing is more a reflection of people going out, people traveling, people going out to dinner, things like that, purchasing services as opposed to goods. But one thing I really wanna point out here is that while services has been increasing 
It's just now kind of getting back to that pre-COVID levels or exceeding those pre-COVID levels. Whereas spending on goods, while well, yes, they have kind of declined a little bit and started to level off, they still far outweigh where we were at pre-pandemic. And so by no means is this trend that we're talking about towards services an implication that we're seeing suddenly seeing this huge drop off in good spending. It's just not really the case. While things have kind of leveled off, it's certainly not a significant drop off that you would typically see during a significant recession, especially given that consumer spending is roughly, I think, 67% of the entire GDP. So it, it's a huge component. And so it's just not kind of reflecting the, the typical slowdowns in consumer spending that are associated in previous uh, economic slowdowns. And one of the other things I want to point out here is that there's other economic data out there that is tied to consumer spending, like retail sales, consumer confidence, the employment numbers, like the labor market, uh, inflation. And those are all metrics that have kind of either A, remained at solid levels or B, kind of turned a corner and have begun to rebound. And we'll talk a little bit more about that with inflation. But again, these and consumer confidence, but again, these are things that are either, you know, A, supportive or B, consistent with continued uh, consumer spending, particularly on goods in the future. So on the next slide here, we're going to take a look at inflation because this is uh, obviously a very a hot topic these days and, and, and is discussed pretty frequently wherever you're reading, digesting news. But basically what we have here is the grayed out region. Uh, the shaded region is the effective federal funds rate, which is the Federal Reserve's method for, you know, rising and lowering interest rates. And this is usually typically help to help out with inflation and kind of get inflation to where they need to be around that 2% levels, which is typically their goal. And so the, the, the yellow line that we're seeing here is the personal consumer expenditure chain type index, which is the Federal Reserve's preferred measure of inflation compared to the consumer price index. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today. And that yellow line is total inflation for all goods. And the red line is total inflation minus food and energy, which are more volatile components. And so the way that inflation is measured too, just a little bit of a background, these, these rates here, the yellow and red lines are year over year percentage rates. And that's, uh, that's usually how inflation is measured. But the two main causes of inflation are basically what we call demand pull which is when consumer demand is pulling prices up. And then there's cost push inflation, which is when supply costs are pushing prices up. And we're kind of in a unique time where we're experiencing both of those right now. And so, for example, the tight labor market, relentless spending, combined with external factors like the war in Ukraine, the China shutdown of their manufacturing and their ports, supply chain disruptions. These are keeping not only prices high on the demand side, but also cost high on the production supply side of things. So we're kind of, you know, seeing this inflation uh, increase based on it's kind of a two-handed approach and, and it's kind of a tricky situation to be in. Now you can see with these two lines that inflation has either peaked or is kind of on its way back down after a couple of interest rate hikes from the Federal Reserve. And the one thing I do want to point out is that the core line, the core inflation rate, which is excluding food and energy, that red line, I do think that the core line could see a little bit more of a drawn out recovery due to really high prices for the housing market, medical services, and vehicle prices. These are all really at elevated levels. And, and I think that that's going to kind of keep that core inflation rate on a little bit more drawn out path as opposed to the yellow line, which has started to correct already and is going to potentially kind of have a more steep drop off just given that it's more closely associated with more volatile goods like gas and food. And some of those prices are already starting to, to kind of come back down. And so I think that that's the situation that we'll see there. The one thing I do want to point out here that's a little bit more forward looking is that the goal for the Federal Reserve is to kind of slow things down. They're trying to cool the economy down to allow supply to catch up with demand. And we're going to talk a little bit more about supply in the next slide with inventories and things like that. But again, the Fed is just trying to slow things down and cool down the economy to kind of get inflation under control. By doing that, they raise interest rates. And when you raise interest rates, you kind of slow economic growth because it's harder to, it's, it's more expensive to borrow money and things like that. So the one thing that I would say 
again, I, I don't personally believe that we're currently in a recession in any way, but the economic slowdown that people are, are referring to is the potential combination of rising inflation or persistent inflation along with these higher interest rates. And so I do think that there's a potential uh, for a recession that people are talking about, whether it's in the first half of 2023 or just kind of a broader economic slowdown. But again, this is by no means, given the economic fundamentals that we're seeing, this is by no means any sort of significant uh, economic slowdown that we saw in 2008 and 2020. People have been kind of citing this potential recession as something more similar to the early 90s when it was single digit, you know, very slow economic decline. So nothing that as as serious as the, the COVID recession or the 2008. Just something to keep an eye out for that that combination of inflation and high interest rates could potentially keep things um, from rebounding. So on the next slide here, we're going to take a look at real private inventory. So these are Whenever you see real, it means it's inflation adjusted. So inflation adjusted inventories. And like we saw earlier, this is one of those components that I was talking about that's kind of taking away from GDP, given that it's just been thrown out of whack by COVID. And you can see that might be a little bit hard to match up with the dates down at the bottom. But those two really high red bars, which are showing the change in real private inventories, the line shows the raw number of inventories and the bars are showing the change or the growth in real private inventories. So in the fourth quarter of 2021, we saw a record high increase in the change in real private inventories. And then following that in the first quarter of 2022, we were right around that same level. So again, two quarters of two consecutive quarters of really significant inventory growth, followed by a pretty steep drop off in growth in the first quarter of 2022. Now, the expectation is that since demand is so strong and supply levels are, uh, you know, are still depending on the supply chain constraints that are facing different sectors uh, are pretty low. So the, the inventory growth is going to continue for the rest of the year. It's just not going to be as much as the previous quarters, like the fourth quarter of 21, the first quarter of 22, and even the second quarter of 2022. So as the inventory growth comes down, it's going to continue to pull off of, of GDP and, and, and weaken GDP. But again, not implying that inventories are going to decline. It's just that the change in the real private inventories or the growth rates of inventories are going to slow. And I think that's an important distinction there. We're going to take a quick look on the next slide here at some specific uh, sectors and their different uh, inventory situations. And so when you look at, let's focus on the red line here, which is retail trade. So that seems to be the, the, the inventories that people are reading about in the news, whether it's Target or Walmart, they're talking about they have too much inventory. But the situation there is that if you look at that red line, you say, well, hey, you're just kind of now getting back to your pre-pandemic levels. But that's not the full story. And the problem, the key to this situation is automotive inventories, which are really, really, really low. So if you take a look at retail trade, less automotive, which is that bottom blue line, you can see that retail trade inventories are just kind of off to the races, really, really, really high levels, uh, significantly higher than pre-pandemic levels. And that's just because automotive, that's a high price inventory, and there's just not a lot of that available right now. And so that's why there's that huge breakaway from retail, less automotive and retail trade as a whole. And again, this is reflective of what we're seeing when you when you hear from Walmart and Target and they're saying we have got a lot of inventory and it may be out of season or it may be out of demand. That's what they're talking about with that blue line at the bottom. So on the next slide here, going uh, taking a deeper dive into the supply side of things, we're, we're going to take a look at industrial production uh, for, of manufacturing and durable goods orders. And so what that is, is the, the, the grayed out region is the subset of an industrial production that just focuses on manufacturing. And the red region, the red lines are manufacturers orders for non-defense capital goods, excluding aircraft. And I know that's a mouthful, but basically what that's referred to is as core capital goods, which is a really closely watched proxy for business spending. And so what this chart is basically saying it's another way of gauging supply and demand from the industrial sector. And what we're seeing is that in manufacturing is basically at a 14 year high and the demand for these core capital goods is at an all time high. So 
again, this is kind of what we were going back. You know, the economy is kind of red hot right now and the demand is really strong and supply is just trying to meet that demand. But basically, it paints a positive picture uh, for domestic activity. And one thing I do want to point out here is that both of these metrics track really well with imports. So imports of goods specifically, too. So while it kind of makes sense that while domestically things are firing on all cylinders in terms of production, you're going to need some imports to come in as well to, to finish off some of the components that you need uh, to, to finish off your production. And so while these do track really well with imports, it's also uh, definitely a positive correlation uh, with imports as well. So finally, we're gonna take a quick look at the residential market, just because it's a good barometer for economic health. But basically what we're seeing here is the 30 year mortgage rate, which actually just as of this morning, I, I, it, I saw that it reached um, the highest level since 2008. So, you know, significantly elevated mortgage rates com compared to, you know, where we've been since 2008, but relative compared to historical mortgage rates, which were pretty high in decades past. But that combination of the, the high mortgage rates and record high prices for homes and things like that, that's really decreasing affordability. And as a result, we're now seeing the lines, which are the three month moving average for housing starts and building permits, those are starting to, to really kind of drop off from really elevated levels. And that's just a reflection of a broad slowdown in the, in the residential market. And that we're seeing a lot of first time buyers that are kind of being priced out of the market essentially. And they're kind of having to sit on the sidelines. So there is one thing to know that there, while there are a lot of people out there looking and waiting for a house, it's so, which is a positive outlook for a more forward looking projection. But right now they just can't do it simply because, you know, prices are way out of whack and mortgage rates are, are rising. So a lot of people on the sidelines, but potential for a strong rebound in housing um, in the next couple of years. So finally here, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this slide, but basically it's just kind of a little bit of a summary slide to go over you know, some of the key metrics that we talked about today and a little bit of a forecast for the rest of 2022 and into 2023. And like I said, you know, pretty significant slowdown heading into uh, 2023 for GDP with 0.7% growth, that's even potentially factoring in a, a, a very small recession or a slowdown in the first half, but ultimately remaining positive for the year next year. But that's consistent with a pretty significant slowdown in consumer spending, business investment on the third line there, second and third line for 2023. And again, just kind of a broader economic slowdown, you know, weaker inventory growth, a decline in housing starts, things like that. The one thing that is, is worth mentioning is that vehicle production has been at depressed levels for so long that the, the thought process behind that is that vehicle production should see an uptick as the supply chain for, for vehicle production improves, which is something that we're already starting to see in recent weeks and months. Another slowdown in industrial production in 2023 as well, just kind of reflecting that, that environment that I talked about earlier, where you've got uh, lingering inflation, persistent inflation, and higher interest rates increased by the Federal Reserve, slowing economic growth. So that kind of combination is painting the overall uh, slowdown that we're seeing in 2023. And I believe that is it for my slides. That was great, Trevor. Really well done, very illuminating. Now we're going to shift from the sort of the macroeconomic view that Trevor presented more towards a microeconomic view of intermodal that John and I are going to talk about. I'm going to talk about international intermodal and John will talk about domestic. And so international intermodal, for those not familiar with the term, that refers to uh, the shipments of marine containers, you know, the 20, the 40, and the 45-foot containers moving inland by rail. Sometimes international intermodal is also referred to as IPI for inland point intact, intact being a reference to the container's door seal that remains unbroken from the overseas origin to the North American inland destination. And so the slide on the screen shows import volume and growth. And really, if you want to understand what's going to happen with international intermodal, you need to understand what's going to happen with import levels themselves. And so for 2020 in full, TTX expects imports to grow 3%. Year to date through July, imports are up about 4%. So a little bit of a slowing in, in the fourth quarter, but still a, a pretty good year. You know, on average, imports grow about 4% annually. 
Um, over the last few years, you know, imports have grown 20.3% since 2019. And I think we all know that the supply chain is congested. And I think this illustrates it. It's a 20% jump in volume when normally it's, it's a much uh, smaller number. So if we look at the, the next slide, I was sort of curious, you know, as Trevor was talking about what's driving all the imports, what's driving the growing inventory, because as Trevor mentioned, you know, companies like Walmart and others are saying, well, they have too much inventory or enough inventory of one thing, not enough of something else. So looking at this chart uh, or table, we can see that really what's growing this year is footwear, apparel, food, tires, toys. Um, so things associated with industrial production, tires and auto parts, and then things maybe associated with the holiday season, footwear, apparel, and toys. And I'll call your attention to the note on the bottom. Uh, this was an article that appeared in last week's JOC, and it was a University of uh, or Michigan State University professor who uh, did some interesting research that the JOC picked up. And he was looking at data from the Bureau of Economic Analysis that reported that spending on import-centric goods is 30% higher from 2019 levels. So again, you know, harping on my theme of, you know, there's congestion out there, either you can measure it in terms of TEUs, which may be 20.3% higher from 2019, or looking at it from the slightly different measure, no matter how you slice it, there's a lot of freight out there. Uh, and that's why everything seems so congested. And so if you look one more slide, I was sort of curious, you know, what's happening with volume from China? Because Trevor mentioned what was happening with China and, and things have been a bit slower. And the way to read this, I know it's a little bit hard to see on the screen, but the chart on the left shows imports uh, from East Asia, which are the countries listed on the bottom of the, of the chart. And China is the yellow bar. And you can see when COVID first became apparent in the first quarter of 2020, and the entire country of uh, China was locked down, imports really sank to well under 2 million TEUs in the quarter. But since then, and particularly in the last four or five quarters, imports from China have been fairly constant at about 3 million TEUs, maybe a little bit north of that per, uh, per quarter. Fourth quarter of 2020 was a little higher. Second quarter of 2022 was a little bit less than that. But as we hear about the lockdowns in Shanghai and other places in China, it really hasn't taken a bite out of volume per se. It, volumes haven't really grown from China as imports in the U.S. have gone up this 20 to 30 percent number, but they haven't declined either. So what's happened is that production is, is being set or demand is being satisfied from other countries in Asia or outside of Asia. And that's the chart on the right showing that the share of imports uh, that China represents into the U.S. is down from where it was, say, three, four years ago. And other countries, such as Vietnam, have spiked up quite a bit. So now about close to 13% of U.S. import demand, uh, containerized import demand, is being satisfied from Vietnam. Another six to seven is coming out of India, whereas a few years ago, that was just two or three percent. And the significance of that is that about 50% of imports from Vietnam land on the U.S. East Coast or East Coast in Canada as well. 90% of imports from India land on the U.S. And, and Canadian East Coast versus roughly 60% of imports from China land on the West Coast. And then the so what of that is, well, roughly 70% of imports that land on the West Coast will route inland by rail and only 20 to 25% of imports landing on the East Coast brought inland by rail. So where production occurs has a pretty big impact on how much intermodal freight there'll be. So if we'd advance it one more slide. And so aside from watching uh, shifts in production, we're also looking at all water share. And for those not familiar with the term, all water share represents the share of imports from East Asia. So again, uh, from that chart, two slides back, we we're looking at China, Vietnam, South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, roughly 60% of imports from that region will land on the West Coast and 40% or so on the East Coast. And last year at this time, the all water share number uh, fell a couple of points as what we think was shippers were simply rushing goods into North America to satisfy demand. And the route from Asia to the West Coast is 
seven to 10 days versus the all water routes to the East Coast can be 21 days or more. So typically, if you want goods to come in quickly, you'll bring them in uh, to the West Coast. But this year, we're seeing a reversion to the historical trend and all water share is picking back up. And exactly why that's happened, I'm not sure. It, it could simply be that it's congested on the West Coast and there's less demand for the consumer goods, less of a rush. So shippers are now looking for ways to bring into places where it's less congested. So that's one reason why it could be happening. Another reason could simply be that I think most of the listeners are aware that the West Coast labor contract expired on July 1st. That's the contract that manages the relationship between the ports and the labor union, the Longshoremen Union. And in times past, they, when that contract was renewed in 2002, 2008, 2014, there were some disruptions that went along with that contract renewal. For the moment, you know, TTX is not aware of any labor disruptions, and that's certainly not unprecedented. There can be contract renewals without uh, disruptions. And so maybe that's what's happening, uh, occurring now, but it may be that shippers were worried about some disruptions and so they move some freight to the to the east coast. And then the third reason, or, or is that really a reason, but you know, longtime listeners will know I like to quote Yogi Berra. And so to paraphrase Yogi Berra, you know, nobody goes to the West Coast anymore. It's too crowded. So with that, we'll we'll jump to the, the next slide. And so another trend that TTX watches uh, to try and understand international inter intermodal demand is transloading. And again, for those not familiar with the term, Transloading is defined as the reloading of ocean freight from the marine container into 53 foot containers and then moves inland by rail. And so sometimes this will help shippers save money, right? You can ship two 53 foot containers inland instead of three 40 foot containers. But I think more significantly, what transloading does is it helps provide uh, retailers to manage their inventory better, to get the inventory where it needs to go faster, and that ultimately increases sales. So it's a logistics inventory management strategy that's become quite popular. And the way to read the chart, what we TTX does is we look at the peers import data and the IANA rail data. And so we can look at peers uh, volume into LA Long Beach, the Pacific Southwest region, and we can look at the IANA rail loading data in, this, in the, their Southwest region, which is pretty much LA Long Beach for imports. And we can just take a ratio between the two. And recently the share of the import, the IPI volume from the IANA Southwest region is less compared to the import volume. And then the transload is the red bar on the chart. And you can see that the transload share is holding pretty constant with transload volume growing as imports into LA Long Beach have grown as well. And the piece that's really spiked up is that bluish gray bar, which is the local share. And the local share is simply looking at the total imports as measured in T, uh, with the peers data and the rail volume data. And the difference between, because the rail volume is less than the total imports, that difference is simply what TTX defines as local. And local can be truly local freight that's consumed in LA Long Beach, or it could be trucked regionally or even beyond the region to Vegas, Phoenix, Salt Lake City. And the increasing local share is fully consistent with the anecdotal stories we hear that, you know, congestion on the rail network, congestion throughout the supply chain, and shippers turning to trucks to, to have some uh, uh, more deliveries as opposed to rail, which will bring us to the last slide on the international intermodal section. And that's the IPI volume and uh, growth rate itself. So last year, IPI had pretty, pretty decent growth of 5%. This year, despite imports growing, IPI is declining. Year to date, IPI volume is down seven, I'm sorry, 10.7%. Uh, in January, it was down 22% for the month. In July, it was down 3.9%. So you can see that it's a, a, a declining rate of falling volume. So we think for the year, IPI will be down about 5%. Again, you contribute that, I think, to the congestion on the rail network, congestion throughout the supply chain, and shippers turning to a uh, truck to get their freight delivered. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to John. And again, there'll be some time at the end for questions. So thanks for listening. Thanks, Peter.
Yeah, good presentation. I'm going to take a slightly different tack than Peter. I'm going to be uh, focusing my first three slides on uh, data that was derived from IANA's ETSO database. If you're not familiar with this database, it is a um, uh, really a treasure trove of information about intermodal volumes across North America that's segregated by uh, the, the market segment via, via international uh, domestic container or trailer. And uh, whether it's private equipment, you can, um, you can slice and dice it by length. The IANA database is an essential tool in, in TTX's uh, analysis and forecasting. We use it on a, on a regular basis. And for, for those that want to do more in-depth research themselves, I highly recommend subscribing to this through IANA. Uh, so with, with that plug, I will uh, jump into um, the overall domestic loadings, um, the performance for the last seven months. So here's an illustration of uh, 2022 versus the prior four years um, down to uh, 2018. And you can see that interestingly, the, um, the, the trend over, over this year has closely matched the month to month activity that we saw in 2021, and even to a lesser extent, 2018. And the, the one, that, one thing that the three of those years have in common is that we are in a severely severe uh, supply restricted as well as high demand uh, peak times. But things are starting to soften. Overall this year, volume is up by just 0.9% above 2021. And as you can see that July showed signs of softening more so than it did on a month over month basis in, in uh, 2021. And our estimates that so far we're thinking that August is gonna show some, some further signs of softening as well. By country, this is, this is North America as a total, of course, but by country, Canada actually has gained 3.5% for the year. Mexico's on the, on the flip side of that, they've declined about 2.1%. Uh, 2 and the U.S. overall is somewhere in the middle, showing a plus 0.8% increase. Overall, if you compare this against the 2018 year that I have here, I, I included 2018, of course, because this was really the, the record year for domestic volumes. And we're running just about dead flat thus far with, uh, with 2018 on a volume basis. But the mix is different. So in 2018, trailers made up about 15% of the total domestic volume, just a, a bit above 15%. And that share now is down to about 10.6% of the total. So if we go to the next slide. So before we go into the container segment, I just wanted to stay on the, the trailers for just a minute. And as you can see, at the, at the beginning of the year, trailers were running about 15% behind the year ago levels. And due to conversions and, and some other issues that I'll, I'll touch on, July was actually running a whopping 29% below year ago levels. It looks like it's eased a little bit in August if you look at the AAR numbers. The AAR numbers that, that just came out for the last four weeks ending September 3rd has the loss at 27.6%. Uh, uh, so not, not much of a relief, but a little less of a decline. We're estimating that about one third, a full one third, probably a little more, maybe 35% or more of the year over year loss is actually due to trailer to container conversion. So it's really a, a zero sum game as uh, trailer loadings actually convert over into the uh, domestic category, domestic container category. We're also, thinking that uh, declining e-commerce demand, particularly off the West Coast, and with the, the parcel and to a lesser extent, the LTL clients that, that are in the trailer segment, uh, that's, that's ha had a negative effect on um, the volume levels. And as, as well as, as Peter is referring to, there's been some share shift. Peter talked about uh, potential share shift off the West Coast. But we do fear that there has been some share shift in general back to truck, given some congestion issues, chassis shortages, and some service issues in certain parts of the country. Um, so they're all, all of those uh, issues are at play here. Uh, but using uh, 2021 as a base year, every 10% loss in trailer traffic equates to, uh, call it a one to one and a half percent gain in the domestic container market. So it's almost like a 10% loss equals a 1% gain. Moving forward, the further declines were, are going to be predicated on trailer lane rationalizations that we will probably see in 2023 and beyond. Uh, we expect that the railroads will continue a methodical pace of lane rationalizations over the next several years as trailer product sunsets. 
So here's a domestic container only. So this is domestic minus the trailers. So thus far, the, the uh, domestic containers have enjoyed about a 4.2% gain for the year. The U.S. is up slightly above that. It's at 4.5%, while Canada's uh, domestic container loadings are up 36 while Mexico is down 2.2. If you account for the trailer to con container conversion effect, which I mentioned in the last slide, which is one to one and a half, call it 1.1%, actual growth in the U.S. Is, was closer to three, just over 3%. Overall domestic container activity in the West really outpaced that of the East. The West uh, showed a 6.1% gain versus the uh, East at 4.5%. And surprisingly, the Northwest was really an outperformer and that was up 12.9%. Uh, and we attribute that at least partially to uh, increased transloading activity in that region. So I did wanna point out while we're on the slide, I do wanna point out some of the issues related to mix in this segment in particular. And when I say mix, that's the, the ratio of rail versus private containers. Rail being the rail owned pool boxes that you're probably familiar with, EMPs and UMAXs, and of course the CSXUs and, and some other rail segment boxes. So the Canadian railroads have retail operations. So they have much higher percentage of, of rail boxes up there. Canada's rail container volumes have been up 1.8% so far this year. Uh, while private container box moves were up 6%. So rail, excuse me, the private boxes uh, volume growth in Canada is outpacing that of the rail. But in, uh, I won't say in contrast, but more in more greater detail with regard to the U.S., rail owned box container loadings are down 9.3%. So a, a much more significant decline than the, the tepid, relatively tepid growth in, uh, in Canada's rail boxes. Interestingly, the Western regions, when we say regions, we're talking about IANA regions now, which make up the Mountain Central, Northwest, Southwest, and South Central states, were down 12%. And in fact, in July, the, those Western regions collectively were down um, an incredible 21.6% on rail-owned box loadings. In comparison, the, the East was only down uh, about 7.2%. And when I say East, I'm only including the Northeast and Southeast. But those numbers are also falling. Uh, July was down 13.4%. So east and west private domestic container box loadings were up both about 6.9% uh, in July uh, on the west and in the east of about 7.7%. So you're really seeing a really big push from uh, rail uh, rail centric product to uh, private-centric uh, uh, product in the U.S. In fact, as a percentage of total domestic container loadings, uh, last year we had about 76% of all domestic container loadings in the U.S. were private boxes, and it's now gone up to 79%. In Canada, it's just 40 uh, private loadings are about 42%, and in Mexico, it's only 36%. So it's much more of a, a rail-owned box market in those uh, in those two countries. And so while we're seeing moderate growth in the domestic container volume overall, nominal container capacity growth has been on a tear. As you can see here, in the industry, excuse me, the industry experienced 8.1% growth in 2021. And on top of that, we're expecting to see an additional 10.3% growth in the fleet in 2022. We're unsure of the ads in 2023, but we're expecting in the 5% range of growth next year. And so we'll refine that as the, as the year goes on into the first quarter um, of, of 2023. But referencing back to my earlier comments about volume mix between private and rail boxes, about 10 years ago, rail share of the domestic box market was 37%, and it's now down to 28% overall. So massive, massive additions in fleet capacity, uh, but just wanted to touch on, on some of the reasons behind that. It's not just growth, that is really one of the, is growth being just one of the drivers behind adding fleet capacity. We're also seeing container productivity that's declined dramatically. Uh, we used to see two, 2.3, 2.4 turns, uh, loads per month out of a box. And now in, in some instances, we're seeing 1.6, 1.7 boxes, uh, box loads uh, per month. And so the, the fleet has been stressed because of low productivity. 
And that in fact, in turn is due to slower turn times on the street. So increased transit times that we've seen from uh, terminal departure to, um, we should say ramp departure to ramp arrival on the street time and increased customer dwell uh, in part due to um, high inventory levels of warehouses and congestion at, at loading facilities and unloading facilities. In addition, we also see that replacement capacity may be at hand here. While the overall this, the fleet is adding capacity, the, the, the fleet members are adding capacity. Uh, there are quite a few older boxes in the market. Several years ago, we did a study and determined that up to 9% of the fleet consisted of the older aluminum and duraplate boxes. And some of the older steel boxes are approaching 20 years of age, which is about the end of their, their um, useful life. And so we think that some of the boxes that, that are going to be coming in are probably going to be converting these, uh, the older boxes into uh, standby capacity for peak periods, if not over retirement should demand flag. And then finally, a lot of the trailer to container conversions are continuing in the expedited market. And from a good news standpoint, those containers are typically more productive. You may see three turns a month on a reefer and in the LTL and parcel environment, that's more of a, a closed loop system. You may get four or five or, or more turns per month on those boxes. Then really quickly, I'm running out of time, but I just wanted to touch on the last slide is the chassis market. This isn't something that we've uh, followed closely over the years. Chassis were never a gating item with regard to holding back capacity and never using that as a proxy for um, volume potential in the market. We've always looked at, at containers for that, but we've seen the elevated street times plus the difficulty in sourcing chassis nowadays, given some import barriers that, that came up early last year for sourcing chassis out of China, which was the, the primary origin point of, of chassis production. This has really raised uh, a lot of concerns in the industry and chassis shortages, I think you've, you've probably read in the Journal of Commerce and elsewhere, that this has been a major gating item in keeping a cap, a cap on volume growth potential throughout the industry. And it's a source of a lot of congestion as uh, you don't have an empty chassis in a terminal, uh, you can't load a box off of a rail car onto the chassis, get it out of the terminal. So it causes congestion up the supply chain. Fortunately, we are seeing that the, the chassis population is growing. We estimated at the beginning of the year about 280,000 boxes. We think that number is north of 300,000 now. And uh, by the end of this year, we may have as many as um, say 320,000 chassis in the market. And we're expecting additional purchases by some of the railroads as well as the, uh, the chassis pool operators, as well as the private box operators that have their own proprietary chassis fleets. We do see the chassis crisis, if you will, alleviating itself in the next 12 to 18 months. And that's my presentation. So if, uh, Hal, if you want to go to the next slide, there you go, Peter. Yeah, well, I think uh, just quickly, we usually show a slide like this where we're watching Trevor and John can chime in, but you know, as Trevor talked about what's going on with interest rates, could there be a recession next year? Like I said, the economy seems in really good footing. And I think what John and I are really trying to understand and watch is what relieves the congestion in both the international and domestic supply chains. And, you know, the time honored way to do this is with, you know, time and money. We'll add capacity to handle the, the 25 to 30% more freight that's moving. Again, Trevor's projection is that spending on services is going to rise, but that doesn't mean we're going to see a major fall off in spending on goods. So the amount of freight that's moving today may be about the same amount of freight that's moving next year. How is the network going to handle that? And then, of course, what's happening. And then the, but the flip side, I guess, to that is you, there could be lower demand for domestically uh, produced goods or imports as well. But that again, that's not really part of the prediction or the forecast right now. And then wild cards that we really can't forecast is simply port and labor rail negotiations and how that's gonna play out. And with that, we can turn it back to Hal. Thank you folks. That was uh, really insightful. A lot, of, a lot of great information in there and a lot of, um, I think uh, stuff that has been on uh, probably a lot of folks' minds, uh, particularly around the uh, the economy and how that links into intermodal performance.
Let's go ahead and dive into some of the questions that we've got. The first goes back to something that you were saying, Trevor, about industrial production. So the question is on on slide 14, uh, does it imply that industrial production dropped to close to zero for a period in 2020? Yeah, and this is just this is more of maybe of a formatting uh, uh, error on my part, but basically it dropped down to around 80 on the uh, industrial production of manufacturing index, uh, which is the lowest point um, since 1997. So it, it it wasn't a quite a zero, but the, I did that so that the axis could could kind of show uh, sort of a trend because otherwise, it, if you show it to zero, it, it doesn't really kind of show any sort of meaningful trend. Right. So, Thank but you. yeah, it went down to 80, but it was the lowest since 1997 for manufacturing. It, was, it wasn't zero, but you could see it from there. For sure. And uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, here's a, a couple of questions I'll try to roll into to one, but um, it's around trailers and the tr- conversion of trailers to uh, containers. You know, for my entire tenure at IANA, we've been talking about the, the slow but inevitable death of the uh, trailer on flat car. Uh, and it seems like the, the supply chain crunch um, gave it gave them some artificial legs. So, so it's a two parter. One is um, when do we think the the conversion uh, from trailer to container is going to wrap up? Um, and the other piece is if we took the the supply chain crunch out of the equation, where do you think the trailer share would be? Good, good questions. I, I would. I'll start with the, the the second question with regard to the, the supply chain crunch and what would have happened if we didn't have that. I, I would estimate if, if you look at trailers in 2019 to 2020, 2018 to 2019, there was a pretty steep tra- drop in in trailer traffic, and then it came roaring back. In fact, trailers led. Uh, you can say it literally led us out of the lockdown, and that was due to the vast amount of e-commerce uh, that was was largely coming out of the West Coast. And so uh, e-commerce orders were being fulfilled off the West Coast and moving inland through the uh, the partial and to a lesser extent, the LTL companies. And and so you saw this big rise. So it was a, a bit of a renaissance for the for the uh, for the trailer market. And then, of course, um, now that uh, you have better uh, you, you have some some flagging demand on the e-commerce side. I believe UPS's traffic was uh, not trailer traffic, but UPS overall, their volume uh, in the second quarter was down about 4%, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so you're seeing some, some decline in e-commerce demand, and then you're also seeing um, some shift away from, uh, from the trailer product, only for the fact that um, driver supply is more plentiful. And so you did see some shift to trailer in 2020, particularly 2021 because demand was so high and uh, drivers were so tight. So I think you probably would have seen, instead of seeing this bump and then followed by a really sharp decline in 22, you would have seen us probably flat to slower decline uh, from 2019 through through this current period. And with regard to the, the outlook for how quickly trailer will decline, that's that's a difficult one because we've we've called the, the, the uh, We've we've called the, uh, the the decline in death of trailer many times and have been um, <laughs> yeah. stymied. So I I, I think I you know I'll uh, look at like Larry Gross. I think he would say five years. I think uh, um, I think five years is probably it, it feels pretty good. I, I think it might be a little longer than that just because of the the stickiness of some of the carriers that are in there now. So that you know it's a it's a high value product. It's expedited service, and and they're paying premium prices for it. And uh, uh, some of the trailer segments are hard to convert, such as the twenty eight foot pups. Yeah. So you, you may see some lanes stick around longer than than maybe anticipated. No, that that makes sense. Um, I think we got time for one more, so I'm going to sneak this in. How do you folks anticipate elections in November having an impact on the 2023 outlook? If any, yeah, I, I think that might have come in during the, the at the end of the economic section. So I can just briefly say, from my perspective, I, I feel like when it, if if however it plays out, uh, I feel like whenever there's any sort of political gridlock, if one has control of the Senate, one has control of the House, then uh, not much seems to to get done. Uh, 
in terms of legislation that would it would move the needle in any way. Uh, but it's it's usually when one house controls both that they can get something that uh, is anything really meaningful that could potentially have an impact. But uh, for the, the Federal Reserve Chairman Powell is uh, in office as in his role for until 2026, I believe, and he's kind of the one that's in the driver's seat for the economy at the moment. So. I, I wouldn't imagine much, but that that's kind of my, if there's gridlock, I would say it would not be good. Yeah. I totally understand that. Well, with that, um, I'd like to to thank you folks for, for joining us today with, with our guests from TTX. Uh, Trevor, welcome to the team. Uh, Peter thank and John, you. thank you uh, again, as always, for, for being there for us. Um, we really appreciate it. And uh, some great stuff, a slightly new format that I hope folks enjoyed. I certainly did. I found it extremely uh, informative and putting a lot of things in perspective. With that, I would say everyone uh, be well, take care, um, and uh, don't forget to come back and see us soon at IANA, the connecting force behind intermodal freight.